I have covered a large variety of cases on this channel. Terrorist attacks, school shootings, jealous husbands, cult murders, serial killers of all varieties, black, white and female. No black female serial killers though. I don't think I know of any black female serial killer. But there's one thing I haven't really covered yet. That is the serial killer couple. A man and a woman hunting down other humans hand in hand. How romantic. It's a love story for the ages. There are many cases to choose from but one of them jumped out at me. I was doing something else and all of a sudden this case was mentioned. Just the name of it alone piqued my curiosity. The San Francisco Witch Killers. It sounds very dark and occult, but it really isn't. I mean it's dark, but that's just the nature of the topic. But it's more about a man and a woman brainwashed by their own beliefs, killing in the name of their religion. It's time to dig our teeth into this one and go back to San Francisco in the early 80s. This is the story about the San Francisco witch killers. It's a bit harder than I thought covering this story. My usual format is hard to put in place, if that makes sense. You see, there's two ways to begin a story. One is with the crimes, and one is with a short but rich background on the main players in the case. But the background on the San Francisco witch murders is way too big. You see, James and Susan lived that romantic, runaway lifestyle. Two criminals in love, running from the law, going around California, smoking weed and preaching their newfound religion, Islam. They were basically hippies before Susan found her calling in an acid trip. She was the one that saw that they had to become Muslims to fight the good fight, the religious fight. Their journey towards death and destruction did begin there, but let's just rewind a little bit. Both James and Susan had come from previous relationships. James used to live in Phoenix, Arizona with his young daughter and his girlfriend. But something noticeable began to change inside James. Transform into something that just made you feel uneasy. His daughter used to be the most important thing in his life. He would braid her hair and care for her like a loving father should. But when he began to transform, he became a different person those loving looks wasn't there anymore, he would barely acknowledge his once so precious young daughter, so his wife filed for divorce and took their daughter away. They moved to Tucson, Arizona. Susan, a divorced mother with two teenage kids, she was also changing and one day she laid her eyes on James Carson. The two hit it off pretty well and soon married, that's when it began. That's when they found each other, and to them, nothing else and no one else really mattered anymore. James' daughter remembers visiting her father and new stepmother. It was like a nightmare for her. He had been so caring and protective of her in the past. Now he and his new wife would physically and verbally abuse the small child. And they wouldn't feed her while she was there. She was starving. There was barely a trace left of her loving father. One day she told her mother what had happened. 
she told her that she had asked her father for a back rub, but instead Susan had began scratching her back with her filthy fingernails, calling her a demon. The child's mother lifted her shirt up and saw five bloody strings across her back. It was time to get away. James and Susan began traveling all over the place, France, Israel and many other places, and so James' ex-wife and daughter took their opportunity to flee and they eventually settled in Southern California. James had by that point changed his name to Michael Bear Carson and Susan had changed her name too, but all she did was exchange the second S in her name for a Z. I will keep referring to James as James, it might be confusing otherwise. Just know that if you see newspaper clippings or things like that on screen that says Michael Bear Carlson instead of James, it's actually James. About a year went by as the two lovers traveled Europe, but when they came back they brought something with them. A parasite, figuratively speaking, a darkness that they fed off with each other. They were a perfect match, but not the match of a good kind. It was a match of a very, very bad kind. The kind of match we call a perfect storm. Their delusions were taking shape at this point. You see, James and Susan had just been on a one-year journey across Europe. When they returned back to the States, the first thing they did was check into a motel room and take LSD. It was during this trip Susan was on inside her mind that the prophet spoke to her. She was given a list of names. The people on this list were witches and they needed to die. It didn't take much to convince James, I'm sure. Susan began writing her list down. One of the names on that list was Ronald Reagan. And he, just like all the other ones, needed to die in the name of the all-American hippie couple's new faith, Islam. Susan would write down elaborate plans to kill the president, although unfortunately for her, the plans would be found in one of their abandoned camps in 1982 and the secret service would get involved. I would say that if you're going on a murder spree that you shouldn't be so clumsy, you know. Detectives, FBI agents, profilers and all that is one thing, but you don't want the fucking secret service after you. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here now. It's time to talk about the actions that gave the couple their name and their infamy as the San Francisco witch killers. When I first heard that name, I thought of ritualistic, sadistic and witch-like murders, but as it turns out, it was the other way around. These delusional fools actually thought they were doing good. Karen Barnes was 22 years old the day she died. Her only mistake was being associated with Susan Carson. You see, one day Susan decided that Karen Barnes was a witch, and we know how the witch killers feel about those. It was on March 7th, some time after the murder, that police arrived on the scene. They had seen a lot in their days as homicide investigators, so to them it was very matter of fact and detached. Karen's body was laying on the kitchen floor, it seemed like she had been shoved in between the stove and the counter and a blanket of sorts was covering her head. There was dried blood everywhere because Karen had been stabbed 13 times. Uncovering the blanket, the detectives noted that her face was black because of all the dry blood covering it. Her skull had been smashed in, just broken like a thick eggshell. It was grisly, tragic and so unnecessary. The stabbings had centered around her neck, chest and face. One of the stab wounds was found inside her mouth. It seemed personal, almost rageful. She had been laying there for about two days, but the Carsons were long gone by that point, but their clumsiness would not escape them. The first clue was a name scribbled on the fridge, Susan. Then they found other names and people to talk to. Eventually they found their way to Marsha, and she knew a whole lot about Karen and the witch killers. Marsha was a landlord and she told detectives of James and Susan how crazy they were, how they would talk about killing witches and how Susan would lock herself in the closet and pray to Allah. But the most damning thing 
Karin had been living with these two crazy violent people all the way up until the murder, that is. So it seemed pretty logical. These two had killed Karin and then escaped. But now they had to find them. Unfortunately, two more victims would become prey and fodder for their delusions. May 17, 1982. That was the day the second victim was found. This time it was a man, Clark Stevens, 32 years old. It was a rough discovery. Clark had been missing for a while and when he was found more questions than answers popped up. His charred, burnt and headless corpse had been buried in a shallow grave. Wild animals had been eating his rotting flesh and chewing his blackened bones. At first it seemed drug related, some dispute over the marijuana business, but that wasn't the case. You see, when James and Susan fled, they eventually landed on Clark Stevens' farm. He took them in and hid them, and they were very grateful for that. But one day an argument arose between James and Clark. And having already murdered once, James picked up a Smith & Wesson he had gotten his hands on and shot Clark Stevens point blank in the head killing him instantly. The other gruesome things they did may have just been an attempt at getting rid of the body, disguising his identity, but again it felt almost personal, the amount of carnage inflicted upon an already dead victim. Two times between the second murder and the final murder, the couple were stopped by law enforcement. By now detectives had connected them to Clark Stevens as well, but both times the couple managed to get out of trouble. On one of these occasions, James had given police a fake name. The police checked up on the fake name and surprisingly it turned up clear. He was free to go. The second time, Susan charmed the officer and the couple was allowed to go on. But by January of 1983, the couple was running out of steam. Barely any cash left and no sleeping bags put them in a rough spot, especially since they knew police were looking for them. So James made the decision to go to his parents' home. So they went, they ate dinner and talked before all of a sudden they had to leave. Rudely and forcefully, Susan commanded James that they had to leave, and James did as he was told, even pushing his mother out of the way as she was begging him to stay. Now they were on the road again, aimless and poor in the northern California wilderness, but their luck seemed to have turned when someone pulled over and offered them a ride. They accepted, but something was off. Standing beside the road in front of the kind stranger, Susan nudged James and whispered to him that we have to kill him. He's a very powerful witch. And so their next target had been determined. Susan kept talking to the man, asking him about astrological signs. With every answer, she knew that he was a practitioner of witchcraft, a demon in disguise. And as they drove further, the man kept getting familiar with Susan even touching her leg. This infuriated her. She was a Muslim. It was forbidden and not only that, according to their beliefs, James now had to avenge the honor of him and his wife. He had to kill the stranger to avenge his wife's honor or he had to denounce his religion. James was hesitant, but Susan weren't. She told him that he had to kill the man or she would have to do it for him. They slept over at the man's place and the next day the stranger named John, 30 years old, offered to drive them to their destination. He had given them a place to sleep and a free ride, but Susan was hell-bent on the fact that he was a demon and that he needed to be killed. The plan almost went south when John offered a woman and her baby a ride as well. At first they agreed and Susan thought to herself that they would have to murder the baby and the woman too, but before they left she backed out. Now they were sitting in the car. James didn't want to kill this man. He was very hesitant when the time came. Susan stared into his eyes and commanded him to shoot the demon. James pulled the gun out and pointed it at the man, but he froze. John and James just stared at each other as Susan was screaming at James to pull the trigger. But James wouldn't. He couldn't pull the trigger on this man. His hesitation got the better of him and John quickly grabbed the gun from him. And now the gun was pointed at James' head. But John didn't pull the trigger either, instead he stopped his car and was going to get out. 
hoping that the couple would leave him alone and just take his car. But Susan was commanding. He was a demon and he had to die. Now James flung into action and the two men got into a very dirty fistfight on the side of the road. They were grappling for the gun and James yelled at Susan for help. She took one of her two knives she carried and tried to stab John in the back. But the blade snapped and she then tried to use her other knife, stabbing the demon in the eyes, but he managed to bite her finger. Eventually John managed to push James off him and ran for his toolbox. But James now had the gun and he used it. He shot at John twice. First time he missed, the second grazed John's head, making him drop the toolbox. Now they had the upper hand and began dragging John into the grassy fields. They had been fighting for almost 15 minutes now. James was exhausted, but he did the task he had been assigned. He shot John twice in the head, making sure he was dead. The odd thing that transpired was the fruit stand boy. He saw the whole thing play out right in front of him. But it was almost like he was just an observer. He was just watching and didn't do anything to help John. James and Susan quickly drove off, leaving John's body in the field by the road. It didn't take long for police to respond though. They had murdered a man by the side of the road in broad daylight. They tried to outrun the cops for a little while, but they had no chance now. They were finally caught. I have to say that it is interesting. Susan was clearly the dominant one in this relationship. She was the leader, but the irony is that they were Muslims. According to the version of the faith they follow, the man should have been dominant and the woman submissive. It reminds me a little bit of Joanna Dennehy. And even without the irony of it, the fact that the woman was the driving force, the dominating force in this relationship, is very interesting. She was using James Bear Carson as her personal killing machine. Today they're still incarcerated, but maybe they won't be for long. You see, James, or Michael, whatever you want to call him, is eligible for parole in 2020, that's next year. If Susan is eligible for parole in 2030, in 11 years. James' daughter, Jane Carson, is still alive and well, has started a petition to stop their parole hearings. Neither James nor Susan has shown any remorse for their crimes. And quite frankly, a parole seems like a slap in the face, because these animals doesn't deserve to be free. They are and always will be a danger to society.